All right, friends, we're going to go ahead and get started with our final teaching series of this, of this summer teaching time. Uh, we're going to start with our opening prayer that we've been doing each week. <clears throat> Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we thank we, your unworthy servants, give you humble thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all whom you have made. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life. But above all, for your immeasurable love in the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace, and for the hope of glory. And, we pray, give us such an awareness of your mercies that with truly thankful hearts, we may show forth your praise, not only with our lips, but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to your service and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory throughout all ages. Amen. All right, well, we have reached the end, the finish line of this teaching series, but I'm hoping that this is not an ending, but is really a launching point from this into uh, just a continu continuation of your journey with the Christ. Um, we're gonna, I'm going to start by summarizing what we've covered. So week one, we kind of looked at uh, the big picture of things and talked about how whenever we are saved, it's not a, a moment, right? And that's it. We are saved in a moment, but we're saved and we start a journey that continues throughout our whole lives as we move closer to God. In week two, we talked about our ultimate calling. What does it mean to love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love our neighbor as ourself? Growing in these things, is called, it's called the process of sanctification. It's becoming holy. And so we talked about that. Uh, week number three, we talked about the obstacles to living the holy life, which is primarily sin, right? We talked about how sin is, we think of sin almost as these moments, right? The fruits of sin. We, I, I lie, and then I'm like, oh man, I lied. I sinned. I fell short. But then we, we kind of grew a, a bigger understanding from there. We talked about, pro, uh, about the roots of sin, the roots in our lives that, that produce these sinful vices. So things like pride and anger. And we talked about how to get rid of those things. We talked in week four last week about suffering. And about as we go through this Christian journey of life, we're always going to experience hard times. And what role does suffering play in our, in our, in our journey with Christ? And so we talked about a few different spiritual disciplines along the way. We're going to round out today and talk about a few more. And... Um, this was, we just scratched the surface, really. Um, I know that some of the weeks it felt like we were drinking through a fire hose. Um, and trust me, it was, it was. It was hard to synthesize everything down into a, an understandable way, uh, a simple way. But I think that this could easily turn into a continuation maybe next summer. We'll see. We'll see what happens. So I want to start with talking about this evening about repentance, reorientation, and, and co-laboring with Christ. As we repent of our sin, we begin a process of reorienting our lives to follow the commands of Jesus. Our duty is to obey God, as summarized in that command, love God and love your neighbor. The entire law and the demands of the prophets are based on these two commandments. Thus, adherence to Jesus' message or obedience requires understanding what it means to love God. Scripture describes Christ as the author and perfecter of our faith. He is the cornerstone of our faith. He is the perfect leader, fit to bring many children to their salvation. So the process of, of learning to respond to God's call requires constantly submitting to this journey of transformation, this realization that our job of, of this journey, right, this job of submitting to God, this job of humbling ourselves, it is never complete. You know, whenever... One of my favorite things to do for, for rest in my life, I, I spend so much of my time 
um, doing things that requires like mental or, or just like a lot of mental work. So writing, preaching, sermon writing, sitting and talking, uh, teaching in the school. I'm constantly using my brain. And so what I like to do um, whenever I have time off is to do things that that are worth with my hands, right? I want to work with my hands. Um, I want to complete a project. And, and there is nothing more satisfying than doing something that I can almost turn off my brain and do. So this is going to sound really silly, but for me, like one of those things is cutting the grass, right? I don't have to think about it. I, I get out there, I start my lawnmower, and I just push it. The brain flips off, and I just make sure that I don't run over anything in the yard, and I make sure that all of the blades get cut evenly. There's something immensely satisfying at looking at my yard at the end of the evening and be like, well done, good and faithful servant. <laughs> this yard is beautiful. The, the, the job is complete. Then I can go in that evening and be like, hm, there's nothing left to do in my yard. It is, it is a job done. And I don't know about you all, but, but there's something deeply satisfying about a job well done. Um, so much of life, though, we don't have measurable marks to know, am I, am I doing well on this or not? We don't get a report God from God every quarter saying, all right, you're, you're, you're a solid B plus in the spiritual growth category. And there's something that is hard about that, right? How do I actually know if I'm growing in the Lord? How do I actually know if I'm continuing this journey appropriately? And so some of us just give up. And we say, I'm not going to grow anymore. I, I look out at my spiritual life, and the hedges are trimmed, and the grass is straight, and I am done. And that's a great mistake. Because the grass of our lives is always growing. It requires constant maintenance. A few weeks ago, I had a little busy stretch where I was gone a couple weeks, and then it seemed to rain every single day, and next thing I know, it was six weeks later, my grass in my backyard was about this tall. And, and that's kind of how it works with our lives. If we are not constantly maintaining the yard of our hearts and our spiritual walk, the next thing we know, we've neglected it for a while, and we think that everything is maintaining and doing well, but we look out in our yard, and there's just full of weeds. The grass is really tall, and now I've got to empty out the bag on my mulch or lawnmower five times whenever I cut the grass. There's sunspots and ugly things hiding underneath the surface. And that's what happens whenever we neglect our spiritual lives. Jesus is calling. <laughs> he wants us to listen. All right. So we, we are listening to this one who is guiding us, the one who wants to transform us, the one who wants us to continue this journey. Now, what happens as we, as we walk with Christ? We're called to become co-laborers with Christ. There's this passage where Jesus is talking, and he says, you know, you look out at the world around us, and he's like, the, the, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. And what we like to think is we, we're a part of a church. We pay the preacher to be the laborer. It's his job to go out there and to reach every lost person out there. It's the preacher's job to pray for everyone out there. And, and in some ways, we've, we've developed a culture in some churches where it's almost like a spectator sport. It's like, I'm just going to come and I'm going to sit here on Sunday morning and, and watch the preacher do this. And then, then I'm going to you know, make sure that he's out, you know, oh, he better be out visiting everyone. He better be out leading everyone to Jesus and leading the lost. And, and, if, and if that's not happening, it's always the preacher's fault. But the reality is the, the preacher's a shepherd and, and you all are the laborers in the field. You all will encounter more people on a daily basis than I will. Because every day I'm here at the school and I see the same people all the time. But you all see the people in your community. You have opportunity to encounter people that I will never have the opportunity to encounter with. Because a lot of us, you know, lived in gated communities and I literally can't get in. And so, <laughs> I'm just being honest. But you also spend time and have invested relationships with people. And part of one of these hallmarks of spiritual growth, if you want to know, like, am I really growing in the Lord? You can look at, am I reproducing? 
I mean, if you can honestly say, man, I have, I have never talked to anyone about my faith. And if that's you, it's like, well, maybe that's just not my personality. Well, the Lord will give you the gift of multiplication if you ask him. And if only we have a heart to say, Lord, I want you to use me, he will give you opportunities. So often, the opportunities are always around us, we just neglect to see them. In my, in my last church, um, I w- I was, I'm passionate about small groups. And anything that I can do to mobilize people into getting together and fellowshipping and talking about their faith, I'm going to do it. So I, I started a little small group, and um, we sat around, we are talking about how to share our faith and, and this, this, this person was sharing, and she said, you know, I'm a nurse, and, and in my environment, you know, like, if I share my faith at all, I'm going to get fired. And I said, really? She said, she, she believed, I will get fired immediately. And, and so I don't talk about Jesus. I don't offer to pray for anyone. I take down, I make sure I have nothing about Jesus at all. Like, no one knows that I have any faith. And I said, well, there are ways to share your faith without just walking up to every patient and saying, do you know Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior? Right? Maybe whenever one of your coworkers is going through a hard time, you say, hey, I'll pray for you. That's, that's not being too much. That's not pushing your faith on them. That's just being a supportive person. Or, or maybe, you, you know, you have a little, uh, you know, a little thing on your desk that says Jesus, and someone will be like, well, what's all that about? Like, why do you believe in that guy? Like, let them initiate the conversation, but you got to be willing to share your faith, and there was just a total resistance to that, and I think that that attitude is not very rare. We, we, we are afraid to share our faith. We're afraid that our faith might come across as offensive, and yet, yet this is, this is a, our calling. Whenever Jesus ascended to heaven, he looked out at his disciples, and it said there were 500 people gathered around whenever this was happening. He was going up to heaven. He said, you know, I will be with you always. Behold, all authority on heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go into every nation, teaching them, you, what, teaching them what I have commanded you, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And lo, I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. This was not an isolated command to a handful of hand-picked disciples. This was a command to all Christians in every generation. A sign, a measure, almost, you could say, a report card of your spiritual growth is whether you are witnessing to others. All right. I'm going to pick up on something that I briefly mentioned, and I'm going to go into a little bit more detail. It's really what I'm doing tonight. It's going to seem like I'm jumping around a lot. Really, I'm kind of picking up on something that I felt like I didn't quite get answered deep enough. I'm going to go a little bit deeper, and we're going to jump around a little bit. So I'm going to talk about the importance of habits in a Christian's life. Recent research, I love my research, recent research says that 45% of everything that you do in the day is done by habit. Think about it. I set my alarm at the same time every day. I get up. I go take a shower. I check my phone. I read the news. I make my coffee. I drink my coffee. I read my Bible. I get in my car. Somewhere in there, there's always some chaos in my house because we have a two-year-old. And so somewhere where my habits get disrupted, but, but if it wasn't for the disruptions, right, I could almost function without even thinking. Now think about your life for a moment and, and your rhythms, and think about if you take out the distractions or the disruptions, how much of your life just happens without you thinking about it? And so, you know, I'm, I'm in this you know, young so- social media generation, and so it's so easy for me to um, pull out my phone and hit the Facebook app and just scroll and lose 10 or 15 minutes just because it's a habit. I'm not reading it. I'm not looking at it. I don't really care what the people have to say. It's just I'm just numbing my brain for a few minutes. What are your intentional and unintentional habits that you have as a part of your life? And habits can be both positive and negative, right? Right? And so, you know, like, I love eating sweets, and oh my gosh, today we had a, a meeting in this space, and on the table in the middle, there were these um, Lifesaver mints that were the wintergreen. I love those things. 
I literally sat here, and as I was listening to the person talk, I'm just like popping them in my mouth. And I'm like, I ate like 20 of them. And all of a sudden, my heart's going like this, and I'm like, what's wrong with me? It's because I ate all of those mints. It's, it was a habit. I wasn't even thinking about it, and I liked it so much. Well, research shows that people have significant trouble changing their habits. A person's environment is such a significant factor in determining success or f- failure um, in personal change because there are cues such as the time of day or location that trigger the repetition of past responses. So whenever I sit at a table where those mints are present, I'm going to eat them. That's a habit. It's there. If I'm sitting at the table and the mints are present, the habit is I eat them, right? Before I, whenever I wake up in the morning, I wake up and I'm sleepy and I want my coffee, so I drink my coffee. That's a habit, and it's hard to break that habit, right? Because there's something about coffee that, like, changes the chemistry of our brain to crave it, to need it. So automatic response of habits, it keeps us doing what we have always done despite our best intentions to act otherwise. When a person wants to change, they often choose between two methods of change, goal-driven change and habit-driven change. So whenever I say, oh, you know, I need to lose a few pounds. I need to lose about 10 pounds because my my pants are no longer fitting like they would and I really don't want to invest in new wardrobe. So what we do is we set a goal, right? I'm going to lose 10 pounds, right? I don't care how I do it, I'm just going to do it. So like uh, some people will go on like a crash diet or they'll, they'll do this or that. They'll do something called Whole30. This was a fad, Lauren, and I did this a few years ago. Whole30, you cut out all joy from your life. And uh, <laughs> you only eat meat and vegetables. You can't eat oils or fatty things or sugary things. You can't have a beer at night. You, you can't have, um, you know, cake. You can't have any pasta it's literally terrible and we did it for 30 days and guess what i lost like 10 pounds like the first day i think (laughs) but here's the problem with with a goal-oriented change i got to the end of the 30 days i lost my 10 pounds that i wanted i felt really great and then guess what i did as soon as i hit my goal i ditched the diet and i gained the 10 pounds back as soon as i saw a tub of ice cream Goal-oriented change doesn't change your life because once you hit your goal, you revert back to your bad habits. Habit-driven change is different. In a habit-driven change, you say, these are some habits that I'm going to change. I'm going to wake up every morning 30 minutes earlier, and I'm going to go for a jog. And I'm gonna, this is a habit that I'm going to instill in my life. Um, instead of eating dessert you know, a sugary breakfast and a sugary coffee and a sugary uh, dessert cookie with my lunch and then a dessert at, at, at supper. I'm only going to, I'm going to save all of that and just eat one small bowl of ice cream at night, right? And so it's a matter of adopting these small changes and it might take you 10 months to lose 10 pounds, but those 10 pounds will stay off because you have new habits that undergird that. Now, I've been talking about very physical, kind of practical things, and you, this is, these are things that you can apply to your life. If there's a change that you want, if you want to start waking up earlier every day, like, you can start practicing this. You change your habit, you will change your life. But this applies to spiritual things, too. You have a habit of picking up your phone in the evening, and you're like, I'm so desperate for community, I want to talk to people, so I'm going to call them, and I'm just going to start gossiping about every little juicy thing that I know. I'm going to tell them things that they shouldn't know. I'm going to tell them the things that I was promised that I would keep secret, but I just can't. And, and so you're like, man, this is a sin that God is convicting me of, and I need to stop gossiping. And so what we, what we do is we got to change our habits. So we deal with, like, okay, I long for community, so maybe I go to a small group. Maybe I go to a Wednesday night teaching and, and fi- experience community that way, and I'm, I'm replacing the bad habit of gossiping on the phone with a good habit of, of fellowshipping with other believers. Uh, maybe I'm, I'm, I'm really bored, and I, like, I watch TV 12 hours a day every day because I'm retired, and I don't know what to do with myself. And... You know what? And that's kind of like being really lazy, and I feel convicted that I should be doing something with my time. And so instead of 
just continuing watching TV 12 hours a day. I don't just stop doing it and not do anything else. I replace it with something else. So maybe I volunteer at God's Goods four hours a day, five days a week, and, and I'm investing a lot of time, but all of a sudden I feel this great sense of purpose in my life. I'm, I'm contributing something, right? Habits undergird everything, including your physical life, your spiritual life. Positive habit formation requires a disruption of an existing bad habit and replacing it with something better. And we have to have a support system for any change that we want to experience. I will talk about this a lot, and I talk about Alcoholics Anonymous a lot because I think it is the, the best system for change in the United States, perhaps in the world, because you go every week. Sometimes you go every day. And you start, and people come to know you. This is a community that people are built. And you're honest. You, you share your struggles. You share your triggers. You share your hang-ups. You share your, your sins. And whenever you fall off the wagon, you show back up the next day, and you said, man, it's been one day since I've been sober. And do the people judge you and hate you and say, oh, what a terrible scumbag you are? No! They're saying we're all scumbags. Welcome to the club. Let's do this together. If only the church were as honest and as authentic as that community, we would be experiencing some major change in our lives. So I'm jumping ahead in my teaching here. That's all right. You can hold with me. One of the spiritual disciplines that is most neglected in our, in our community is the discipline of confession. And this is a discipline that is, that is lost with fasting, right? Fasting is hard, it's uncomfortable, but, but confession is a whole other level of uncomfortable. Because in confession, this comes from James chapter 5, it says, confess your sins one to another. It says, let me find this reference here. Um, confess your sins one to another, the faithful fervent prayer of a righteous person availeth much. If you want to experience healing, it says you got to confess your sins. And the interesting thing here is that this is very clear biblical evidence. It doesn't say confess... Sorry. It doesn't say confess your sins to God. Now, we have to confess our sins to God, but here it specifically says confess your sins one to another. Why? Two things. Whenever you confess your sins to another person, in our liturgy, it talks about this. We, we do corporate confession where before we go to the communion table, every week we confess our sins. It's a general confession. All, most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done, by what we have left undone, right? You know this prayer. We say it every week in, in our historic services. And the priest looks you eyeball to eyeball and says, you are forgiven, there's something powerful about, about confessing your sins to a person because that person, you, you can't hear Jesus always speak to you. Sometimes you can have those experiences, but most of the time it's not something that you get. But you can have this person who's standing in the place of Christ saying, you are forgiven. Jesus forgives you. And there's something immensely liberating about having someone look you eyeball to eyeball and say, you know what? Jesus has forgiven you for these sins that you've confessed. The second thing is, whenever you have to confess your sin to someone, like you have an accountability group, it makes you really motivated not to sin. Like, I'm being honest here. I have a, I have a small group of guys, and we haven't met recently, but for, for several years, we were meeting every week, and every week I knew that if I did this sinful thing, I had to tell my friends about it. And, and we were in this trusting, like, covenant, accountable relationship but it was a powerful motivator to say, you know what, I'm not going to do this sin. I'm not going to, I'm not going to flip this person off running down the road because I'm going to have to tell Sean and Matthew about this. It was a powerful thing. What would it look like if we had that type of community in the church where we really felt like I could trust you enough not to go and gossip to everyone else about this, but I could really say, this is a struggle in my life and I need help. In Alcoholics Anonymous, it's beautiful because everyone knows what your struggle is. It's not a secret. Everyone's an alcoholic. 
It's not some secret thing. It's not something that we're being shameful about. And so they end up, because of that's a big secret, this big shame that they've just been like, all right, I'm going to be open and transparent about. They're going to share anything. They're going to share absolutely whatever go is going on in their life. What would it look like if we were like that in the church to say, you know what? I can get together with my small group of friends and I can say, I had a really crappy week this week. And you know what? Because I was dealing with this, this hard stuff, I made some stupid decisions. And I'm sorry, but I need some help making sure I don't do it again. What would it look like if you had a friend that could call you up on the phone on a Wednesday night and say, hey man, I'm praying for you. How are you doing this week? Have you messed up? And not in a judgmental way, but in a loving way that offers gentle correction. If we want to experience change in our lives, we have to be willing to be vulnerable. We have to be willing to open up to someone else. We have to be willing to confess our sins as a spiritual discipline. As a spiritual discipline. As we confess, we will have freedom. We will have freedom. When we confess our sins, we step into a posture of humility. We realize that we are not alone in our sin. Because whenever you're sitting around a table with three or four other people and they start confessing their sins, you're like, oh my gosh, I'm not as bad of a sinner as I thought. <laughs> and that's not saying it in a judgmental way. That's a saying of like, you're struggling with that too? Thanks be to God. And you can encourage each other together. When we mutually confess our sins, our humanity is no longer denied. We become more authentic, and we are transformed. Transformed. All right. So throughout this study, we talked about fasting. And I know several groups in here uh, decided as a table that they were going to start practicing some fasting. And I hope that you have experienced um, God in some way through these experiencing fasting. Uh, this is something that I was taught a long time ago. I didn't say this, but fasting ultimately is whenever we decide that we, we, we're going to give up something that we love in our life because there's something that we love more. Someone we love more, that's God, right? I'm giving up a, a thing because I crave to know God, to experience God. And so I hope that teaching on fasting is something that you will ex consider doing in your life. Uh, we talked about simplicity, the importance of uncluttering our life so that we can really be focused on what matters most. We talked about the importance of worship. We talked about the importance of celebration. Um, so a, a big important spiritual discipline that we haven't talked much about is prayer. Um, but I, I'm preaching a two-part series on this right now that really is a whole, it's much better than what I could share in five minutes. So you can check out part one online and part two is coming up this week at Buckwalter and a couple weeks over at Historic Campus. And so um, we're gonna, let's dig, dig deeply into the importance of prayer and the Lord's Prayer and how it serves as a guide for our lives. Um, the next spiritual discipline I want to briefly talk about is study. Almost, this is what's natural for us as Americans is I, whenever I want to grow, I just want to learn something. I want to take a class. And so there's something that's almost very natural. So I spent way more time talking about heart formation, the spiritual disciplines that change our hearts, rather than the disciplines that change our mind. But I will point this out just briefly. Study is the transformation of the mind. Romans 12, 2 says, do not be conformed to this world, meaning don't just follow the patterns of everyone else around you. But it says, be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern the will of God and what is good and acceptable and perfect. We need to study the scriptures. If you're not in the Bible, really, every day, digging into God's word, letting that be your moral compass, letting that uh, be the guide for your life, the rule for your life, you're missing out. And you're never going to have a, a sense of truth or right or wrong if you're not digging deeply into the Word. We need to be thinking about the things of God. We need to gain a deeper understanding of God as our Lord. And so as we are formed in our knowledge, we need to be studying things like the Nicene Creed, the Apostles' Creed, the, the Ten Commandments. If I said, all right, who can give me the Ten Commandments in order? Can, in, can anyone do that? I, I can't. 
but are we, are we studying the things that are important? Are we really allowing these things to internalize and, and to guide our life and our knowledge of God? Whereas meditation and these other disciplines are devotional, study is an analytic thing. And so here are a few keys to, to how to study. Number one, if you want to study, you need to do, be repetitive about it. Repetition is key in study. You can't just study once, you know, for 10 minutes, three times a year. You have to study continuously. You need to be studying new things. You need to be reading good books. And I have several books that I'm going to be recommending this evening. Secondly, you need to give yourself space for concentration. Give yourself a, a quiet time where you can really engage deeply with this material, where you can challenge yourself to grow. Um, a, a, lot of, a, a lot of Christians in the United States just don't spend time thinking critically about their faith. Study things like apologetics so that whenever someone says, well, how do you know Jesus rose from the dead? You don't have to say, well, I just believe it. Yes, we just believe it, but we actually have some scientific, analytical, historic evidence for the resurrection of Christ from the dead. And let me tell you, you want to you put them in their place real fast. Well, you can start whipping off some of these details about how, you know, this guy named Tacitus, who was a Roman, a Roman historian, talked about the risen Jesus Christ and the trouble he was causing in Judea, a totally secular, totally non-Christian person talking about the historic evidence of Jesus Christ. Like, that's a really interesting statistic, a really interesting fact that you can share with someone. Whenever someone says, you know, I don't think the Bible is really all of that reliable. Why are you trusting this manuscript that has millions of errors in it? And then you say, well, actually... How about we look at how many of those errors actually change the meaning of it? And then you start talking about the reliability of these ancient scrolls and, and the, the, the textual and analysis of the different manuscripts that we have over these thousands of years. And then you realize, wow, like a very small percentage, there's, there's, a, there's really a fractional difference in, in these manuscripts. This is the word of God. And here's some proof for that, Right. And if your eyes are kind of glazing over, like, I understand that. But, but we're called to engage deeply in what we know about our faith so that we are ready. What does Scripture say? Always be ready to give an answer for your faith. Are you ready to give an answer when someone questions? Study. Repetition. Concentration. Number three, reflection. What does the thing that we are learning mean? What does it mean, reflection? Number four, application. How does what I learn change my life in some way? Well, let me tell you, if you're studying textual criticism about the Bible, and you're, you're realizing this is not only a reliable book, I really believe this is a wor the Word of God, let me tell you, that will change how you view the Bible. That will view your trust of it. That will, that will change um, everything on how you engage with it deeply. And finally, number five, how to study Embrace humility. Don't think that you have every answer. Always be willing to engage more deeply and go deeper into understanding God's word. As you go into understanding things about God, we're always learners on this side of eternity. All right. Our next discipline is solitude. Solitude. This is a strange one for us. Generally, People fear being alone. Richard Foster, in Celebration of Discipline, says, Think about the people that are fearful. The new child in a neighborhood who sobs to her mother, saying, No one ever plays with me. The college freshman who, who yearns for the high school days whenever he was the center of attention and now is a nobody. The powerful business executive who has all of these people who, who work for them, but, but no one loves them. No one likes them. And so they sit in their, in their tower full of authority, but totally alone. The person who loses their spouse and finds himself sitting at home and laying, thinking, I hate being alone. We hate loneliness. And so we flee from it at every opportunity, right? We, we seek to constantly be around others. But, but there is a balance in life between loneliness and an overly cluttered life. And so solitude is a spiritual practice that is a state of mind and heart. It is a quieting of our soul so that we can hear the quiet voice of God. 
I talk to a lot of folks who say, I feel like I've never heard God's voice. And I ask them, well, have you ever listened? And they're like, well, sure. I'm like, have you re- ever really listened? And I tell a story of Elijah. Elijah was one of the most powerful Old Testament prophets who, who ever lived. Like, if you read the stories, the stories of Elijah are just amazing. And, and one of these stories is he was on top of this, this mountain, right? This showdown with the prophets of Baal. And uh, it's this, this competition to say, like, whose God is the real God of Israel? Is it the prophets of Baal and their God, or is it Elijah's God? And Elijah says, well, let's put our God to the test. And he says, Take, build two altars. And, and they built two altars. And now, now put, uh, put the, the, the sacrifice on the altar and cry out to your God. And whoever sends fire down from heaven, that is the real God. And so um, the, the prophets of Baal cried out and, and, and they says they slashed themselves. And, and Elijah's a real sassy dude. And he says, maybe your God's pooping. So maybe you need to cry, cry louder to wake him up. I mean, that's really what it says. It's, it's amazing. Charlie is our biblical scholar. Is that right, Charlie? He gives me the thumbs up. All right. So uh, maybe your God's pooping and you need to wake him up. So they shouted louder, and they did this for hours. And Elijah says, okay, my turn. The first thing he does is go, and he gets the buckets of water, and he pours the buckets of water and, and over the altar. So it's not only like the, the whole thing is drenched. And it, I don't know if any of you all were Boy Scouts. I wasn't. But it's hard to make wet wood catch on fire. In fact, it's kind of an impossibility. And so immediately what he does is he falls on his knees and says, Lord, prove you are who you say you are. And it says fire immediately came down from heaven, and it, it consumed uh, the, the, offer, the offering, the sacrifice. And Elijah was like, told you. And so immediately this act you know, made the queen really mad, Jezebel. So Elijah runs away. He goes on a mountain. And this is the next thing he says. God, I wish you would just kill me. I'm all alone. No one else is a faithful Christian, or Jew at the time, sorry. No one else is a faithful Jew. I'm all by myself, and I hate it. So just take my life already. He entered this stage of total depression, despair, loneliness. And an angel Right, it appears before him and says, hey, go outside. And Elijah's like, fine. Like a grumpy teenager, stomps outside and says there was a, a great earthquake. Then there was a great windstorm. And then there was a fire that raged across the mountain. And Elijah just sits there watching these amazing things happen. But it says God wasn't in the noise. like a gentle breath of wind and Elijah covered his face he went in because he knew he had been in the presence of God in the storms of life it's hard to hear God's voice in the fire in the storm in the earthquakes God's still there but it's hard to hear him And if Elijah had just gotten intimidated by the storms, he never would have stood there long enough to hear the voice. But he stayed, he heard the voice of God, and then he went in, and he was energized. And then this is the amazing thing. The angel of the Lord said, here, eat some food and take a nap. Sometimes you just need to take a nap in life. That's my wife's favorite thing to say whenever she's talking about this story. And so sometimes you just need a snack and a nap. And and so Elijah took a snap, uh, ate a snack, took a nap, got up, and then he went and he continued his ministry. But he wouldn't have done that if he hadn't gotten to this place of despair and say, okay, God, speak to me. So are we taking a balance in life? Are, is our life so cluttered that we're never alone to just be present with God? Are we going to the mountain of God and looking past the storms of life to say, God, speak to me, and giving him space to speak? That is the importance of solitude. All right. Confession we've already talked about. And then finally, I want to talk about service. Jesus embodied the humility of a servant throughout his whole life. No better, it was no better illustrated than whenever he took his clothes off, and got a robe and a towel, and he washed his disciples' feet. This totally abject 
humiliation, this, this work that of a servant he did. And so service is a discipline where we come to know God more as we serve someone else that is in need of that. Um, it's hard to imagine serving because service is saying no to the world's games of self-promotion. It is an embodying of deciding I am going to serve and be the last. Service is not just an occasional mission project. It is a way of life. Emptying yourself, being the servant, stooping down to wash the feet of others. Now, if you've never served before, that occasional mission project can propel you into a life of service, but that occasional mission project isn't service. Uh, service is a lifestyle. It is an emptying. And really, if you want to know, if, you wanna, if you're like, I crave to know God more, then I challenge you to go on an international mission trip to a really poor place. If, you, if you're like, I really want to know God, that's where you're going you're, you're to see him. I know that I, there's several folks in here that have been on international mission trips. I'm sure that every one of them would say, you know what, I encountered God more clearly and more loudly in a place of absolute poverty and a place of suffering more than I do in a hundred days here. And so service teaches you something about the character of God, and it enables you to be like Jesus, to pick up your cross, to follow him. And so serve. Serve the Lord, serve others. All right, I am all messed up in my notes here. I've literally flipped back and forth. I have no idea where I am, so I'm just going to jump to the end. Where do we go from here? Now, I have one thing, and this is my hope. If, if just one table in here, one table says, you know what? I love these people that, that I've been talking to each week. I'm not a part of a small group, and I want to continue. If just one group in here continues, I will be 100% satisfied. Because, again, you will learn a lot, I hope, in worship. But the experience of transformation is going to happen in the small group experience where you're doing life together, where you're holding each other accountable, where you're opening up more in vulnerability, whenever you're getting into the hard things of life. And so... If you all are interested in continuing in a small group, I want to provide resources for you. And so, um, number one, every week uh, we post, we, we have an email newsletter that comes out from the church. Um, it's called the E-News. And there's a little blog, a little devotional. If you keep scrolling down, sometimes it's very long, so sometimes you don't see all these things. But there are always sermon notes. If you click on the sermon notes, it has a summary of the sermon and then small group discussion questions. And so the very easiest thing for you to do, say, I have had such a good time with my small group, we're just going to continue meeting on Wednesday nights, and then you just pick a place. Maybe you meet at one of your homes and you continue the rhythm. Or maybe you rotate through different homes and, and have a meal together, and you just keep meeting. And whenever we go back to having our, our Wednesday night teachings, you'll see them coming up. You can just bring back in to say, all right, we're going to meet in a home for six weeks, and then, hey, Jonathan or Padre has a, a teaching coming up. We're going to go be a part of that for two, three, four weeks, okay? And so that, that's like the easiest easiest way to continue this, and I will gladly shepherd you, walk with you, help you get that started, help organize that for you. So if that's you, come talk to me, and we'll get it done. Um, and you could, I think that small groups are a great way to invite your neighbors. Like, if you're meeting in your neighborhood, and your, na and your neighbor is like, I am never going to go to church, well then, like, hey, come over and have dinner. And then it's a small ambush, you know? <laughs> But how many people do you know would never show up to church on Sunday, but they'd come over for a meal and a talk? Yeah? If you want to lead people to Jesus, that's like the easiest way to do it. Um, secondly, you can do a book study, and I have about a million books that I could recommend that you all do. And so if, if you want that, I will tell you what books to do. Um, here's one that I have read and I love. It has discussion questions, and it really resonates with the things that we've been talking about. It's called Liturgy of the Ordinary. Yes, that's a picture of a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. And what she's doing, this, uh, the author in this book, what she does is she talks about the everyday things of life and how they teach us about God. 
And so she talks about making the bed and the spiritual rhythm of making the bed and some, some things that you can think about while you make your bed about God and, 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 and undergirding the ordinary things with these spiritual things. It's really great. She talks about brushing your teeth and losing your keys and eating leftovers and checking email and sitting in traffic. Talk about sanctification. Um, <laughs> this is a good book. It's a good book, and it's very easy to read. This would be a great place to start in your small group. Um, the author is Tish, T-I-S-H, Harrison Warren, and she is an Anglican, an Anglican in Pittsburgh. All right. Celebration of discipline. We've talked about this already several times. Um, I can pr th this book does not have a study guide, but I have one that I can provide to you that has discussion questions for your small group. Um, if you want, if you're like, I'm ready for level number two, like let's ratchet it up a little bit, you know, I'm ready to jump into the deep end. Um, this is a book called You Are What You Love. You Are What You Love. The author is James K.A. Smith. James K.A. Smith. This is an intense dude. Uh, but what he does is he really pushes you to think about what do you love in life? Do you really love God? Let's look at the things that you spend time on. Let's, let's dig deep into that and, and really analyze how can, I, how can I come to a place of reflecting God? What do my habits really say about who I worship and what I worship? Um, this book was immensely uh, challenging for me, um, and I know it will be for you as well. And uh, I don't know if there are discussion questions in this, but I think I can find some if you want to do this, this book. Finally, um, this is a more of an intro book. It would cover a lot of the things we covered in this study, but offer you the opportunity to go deeper. It's called Invitation to a Journey, a Roadmap for Spiritual Formation. The author is Robert Mulholland. Uh, this is like the classic spiritual formation book. Uh, this helped form guys like Dallas Willard. Um, this is excellent. And I've got a bunch of other books. These are just four particular that helped form my study and my preparation for this teaching series. If you want to do more on The Seven Deadly Sins, which I highly recommend, a book called Glittering Vices. Glittering Vices. I don't remember the author off the top of my head, but it's, it's a very good, easy-to-read book. All right, so those are some resources. Um, and if you want to talk more about how to be in a small group or how to do this on your own, come talk to me, um, because we want to mobilize you. I, I pray that the day will come where every person who attends church on Sunday is in a small group sometime else throughout the week. That's how we'll grow. All right, so that's all that I have. That's all I have. But I wanted to offer the opportunity, before we go into small group discussions, to wrap things up, or hopefully begin to continue things. Um, is there anything that I missed? Anything that I didn't go deep enough in that has been burning a question that you would like me to answer here in front of everyone? I just want to offer the opportunity for a little Q&A. And if not, that's okay. But do you have something? I did something either really well or really bad. <laughs> All right. That, I'll take it. I'll take it. Let's pray, and we'll, we'll conclude our time. Lord, I thank you for this opportunity and for all of these faithful folks who came here for, for five weeks and, and just learned about you. I pray, God, that you will take what we have learned and take us on in our journey as we come to love you more and our, we love our neighbors more and we walk more faithfully with you. We thank you, Jesus. Amen. All right, let's turn into our tables and do a little discussion. If you haven't filled out the survey yet, please do that.